rocking and rolling. We are live on today's episode of Innovation Hour with Edgar and Jay Say. Today we have a special secret super guest that we you can see below, Shannon Stowell. Shannon, how are you doing, man? I'm good. How are you, gentlemen? Good. So we're gonna today we're gonna talk about the design of what's possible, the design of what's next, maybe. And uh, we're gonna just bounce thoughts around and see where the conversation goes. Edgar, uh, you want to get us going? I know we have a celebrity guest, so you might want to do a little introduction <laughs> about who this guy is. <laughs> a true celebrity. So if you if you uh, go to his LinkedIn profile, which I hope you do, because Shannon's just a phenomenal human being, uh, both in terms of accomplishments as well as what he contributes to the world. If you want to think about leaders that are innovative and uh, and think into the future and uh, think in the broader perspective of goodness for the world. Shannon, uh, you are one of those people. Uh, just amazing work you've done. And if you go to Shannon's uh, LinkedIn profile, you'll see that uh, he was named as, uh, in 2019 as one of the 42 most influential people in the world with respect to uh, the, the great outdoors by Outsider uh, Magazine. And uh, it, what I really like is when you go to look up where Shannon is, it's in no particular order. The thing is he's wedged, he's sandwiched, literally sandwiched top and bottom. I think it's Lindsey Vaughn, right? And, and who's below you is uh, uh, Greta Thunberg. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just yeah, cool. amazing company that you're in. Just, uh, just I'm, still, really I'm still in shock myself, believe me. <laughs> well. I, I, yeah, I, well, knowing you and your personality, I could see your, uh, uh, that, hum that uh, humility side showing through. The other thing is, is I often tell Shannon that as if his hair were gray, then we have, uh, and a little bit more, you'd have to put a little bit more meat on your bones around your jaw. You'd have Al Gore sitting with us, which is, uh, <laughs> so just to let you know who Shannon is, he's the CEO, he's the founder and CEO of the, uh, Adventure uh, Travel Trade Association, which is a worldwide organization that really focuses on adventure travel and looks at it from the pr a pretty broad perspective around economic and uh, environmental impact. And really at the end of the day, it promotes everything that is good about adventure travel uh, and uh, really works hard at uh, assuring that uh, there's a high, level of, uh, a high level of awareness and consciousness about the impact that uh, travelers have on, on our world, in particular, the places that are really uh, more or less sacred to us in, in the world order. He's also one of the uh, co-launchers of the uh, Adventure Travel Conservation Fund, which does some of that work in that area. And um, so uh, I, I don't have much more of a welcome for you than that, Shannon. Uh, so hey, that's welcome wonderful. To, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you with us. Oh, I'm honored. So top of top of mind, and I know having just spoke for, with you a few days ago, that uh, the uh, the impact of uh, COVID-19 um, on uh, world travel, as we all know, has been uh, in a, in nothing short of staggering, and its ripple effect as as is still coming to bear as a result. So um, more than uh, I think, a good place to start is just on your uh, reflections, your, your current thinking about what's going on in the world. Yeah, well, uh, Edgar and John, last year, uh, I, I think I was in three different interviews at least where I said, and I was a little nervous to say this at first, um, but just said, I wouldn't mind seeing tourism numbers decline a little bit until mm -hmm. we get it right. And um, so hopefully it wasn't me jinxing the planet with that, but uh, the tourism numbers dropping happened in, a, in an obviously in a really seriously dramatic way and it happened so fast. Um, I won't forget many, many moments, but one of the moments that particularly stands out to me is a really strong member of ours who's always run a really diligent uh, closely managed adventure travel business. And he, he was shaking his head and this is in March. And he said, we went from having what would be a $10 million a year to 
scrambling to save the company in 10 days. And, you know, I think the experience that this person had is not uncommon right now in the, in the travel space. So it's been by far the harshest thing we've ever, it's the harshest thing travel industry has ever seen because other major events, even like World War II, tourism was still very, very fledgling. So this is truly the biggest shock to the system that our industry has ever seen. Now, when you think about how, um, how it's impacting, I know you have a great degree of, of uh, insight into uh, local economies and um, mm -hmm. uh, also the the impact that it has on so many really local economies and then of course uh jobs and, mm -hmm. and what's happening there uh what can you share with us to give us a perspective on some of the influence or impact at local at local levels yeah it's it's funny because tourism typically does not get taken very seriously by governments around the world necessarily some do of course and some are very reliant on tourism but they're are lots and lots of cases of tourism always taking, you know, last place when it comes to uh, decisions in governments because some of the industries are so easy to measure like automobile or oil or, or whatever. And tourism is one of those industries that's woven in throughout everything. And so for the first time, governments are gonna really see how a lack of tourism really, really impacts their overall economy because it, it literally impacts almost everything in an economy. And so with local economies, this is really probably our number one concern right now is all of the, the families and individuals throughout the world who are either partially or almost fully reliant on, on tourists showing up in their destination. So for example, I'll just give one example, a place called Fainan Eco Lodge in Jordan and they've made a strategic decision to, instead of pulling all the services in-house, they've decided that they're going to let the, the lady that lives down the road be the baker for the fresh warm bread that comes to the lodge three times a day for, for the meals. They could bring it in-house and it would be more efficient for them and they would, they would spend less money on it. They've made a decision to have that woman be their baker. And that one little business alone supports 80 Bedouin families. And so those families are, they love the lodge, they love the guests that come there. They're, it's a good relationship. And those are the people I'm the most worried about is at the end of the day, when tourists stop going somewhere, you know, there's just, there are thousands and thousands, now hundreds of thousands of people who are out of work I, I read the other day that 100 million tourism jobs have been lost in the last 90 days. It is catastrophic. Um, when you when you look at that through that lens and you 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 start thinking about entire communities, mm -hmm. entire you know that are reliant. Um, you said something interesting at the front end of that, or at least I, I the way that I the way I heard it was that. Um, a lot of countries, uh, a lot of governments don't see the tourism as having that great of an effect until now, of course, it's going to be absent. And now you see this sudden surge of unemployment, everything that, that comes with it. There right. seems to me that you know, when we think of innovation, we think about solving problems. It seems to me that there's a certain mindset that comes with this, that um, if you're in the business, if you're in, in, in tourism hospitality at all, uh, so often, and this goes back to the comment you made about, you know, where you can measure the number of cars that are manufactured. There's a lot of <clears throat> different measurements, but this one really uh, goes beyond the idea of efficiency and effectiveness around the way that we generate our economies. This one it seems to be more of a mindset of looking out for the community. How often in your, in your, in your experience do you see that? Is there any way that you can uh, give us some sense about how much is driven by efficiency and just dollars and profit versus the whole idea of, of actually supporting a community and, and having them a mindfulness about that. Yeah, no, it's a great, it's, that's a great thing to, to take a closer look at. One of, one of the really, I think, shocking but 
powerful statistics in tourism is that um, in many cases, mass tourism, which would be described as places like all-inclusive resorts or cruise tourism, um, those sorts of enterprises or, or big international chain hotels, the money that is spent by the tourist, by the traveler, only 10% or less stays in the destination. The leakage of that economic uh, outflow is significant. So we decided a few years back to try to get a handle on what does adventure tourism, how does it look differently? And what we found was that 65% of the revenue that the tourist spends, the traveler spends, stays in the destination. And that's because it's using all those little businesses, the guides, the, the lodges, the, the restaurants, crafts, music, art, whatever it might be. And so this is one of the messages that we continue to try to talk to governments about, which is, um, so uh, Jordan's a good example where the, the Dead Sea is their mass tourism venue. And right. it drives, um, it drives a, a lot of top line revenue, but the amount that stays is not significant because most of the hotels are owned by multinational corporations or, or international corporations. The Jordan Trail, on the other hand, is a much smaller piece of Jordan's tourism, only about $7 million. But a significant percentage of that money stays, and it stays in those rural communities. And it also employs, we, in the study that USA did, um, almost double the amount of women that, uh, that have jobs in the rural and adventure tourism versus men. And it makes sense because they're serving the guests in their homes, in their lodges, making the food. So our argument is, has always been that tourism by itself is not necessarily good or bad for a destination. It can be either, and tourism can be terrible for a destination. Um, so we always encourage governments and anybody who will listen to say, take a very, very close look at your tourism. What is it actually doing? What's the whole picture? The, the number of people that land in the country almost doesn't matter as much as what is actually happening, being left behind. Um, I had a minister of tourism tell me once, she said, our people are a very proud people. This is why I love adventure travelers. They are rarely rude to the bellman, rude to the waiter, to the bartender. They're very grateful, they're thankful. And sometimes they don't get that treatment from the, the larger volumes of tourism. And so not only does it matter to us economically, but how it, how it hits our social fabric, you know, how, how does that land for our people? Yeah. So uh, I'm going to ask you yeah, then. I, but, yeah, yeah, so all of this reminded me a lot of, um, so I live, when I was living in, actually did a master's in uh, innovation and tourism, and mm. we focused a lot on mega cities like Barcelona, Madrid is really good, or um, yeah, they're good case studies. Mm -hmm. After people have been stuck in their houses for so long, more often than not in cities, what are you i know you don't have a crystal ball but what are you anticipating happens people have been stuck inside in cities is it going to be a mass escape looking for that type of adventure tourism you mentioned kind of getting away from people or what are you anticipating is going to come out um, as far as uh, consumer behavior what are people going to want after all of this well i, I think simply because of the the number one uh, the number one rule, so to speak, right now is distancing um, or maybe hand washing, one of the two, or wearing a mask, one of the three. Um, what we're hearing is that it's going to roll out, and everybody's saying this, uh, it's going to roll out for local first and then domestic in the area and then international will happen last. And that these, these uh, characteristics of adventure travel of small groups, remote locations, nature, open air, outdoor, healthy, family, friends. It's, it really, adventure travel is checking, all the, is checking all the boxes for the type of tourism that people are gonna be looking for. I don't think people are gonna say, you know, all of a sudden, golly, I'm gonna be an adventure traveler now. But I think they will be saying, I don't wanna be in crowded spaces. In other words, I'd like to be somewhere more remote. 
I don't want to be with crowds. In other words, I'd like to be in a smaller group setting. And um, mm -hmm. so I think that some of the things that define our sector are going to be the reason that it, that it recovers more quickly. And then the adventure travelers, the existing adventure travelers, of course, they're, they're more inclined to get going earlier uh, than, than the tourist who may be making a decision between, do I do a Florida beach vacation or remodel my kitchen? Decisions. Whereas the person who's a bird, they're going to go birding. <laughs> mm. That's exactly what well, that's in my head, the direction it was going to go. But off of that, it makes me wonder, there are platforms for people to say they don't have a bed and breakfast set up, but they do Airbnb or VRBO. Um, historically in cities, again, Barcelona, there were riots in the street because it caused the prices of rent to go way up. Is there any mm -hmm. fear with that uh, from your groups about the types of communities you're working with and being taken advantage of? If, if you can't make money in traditional, maybe those big giant monsters will turn to the smaller communities and start trying to poach those. You know, I, I have to just be totally transparent and say, I don't know. I don't know. There, I've heard experts stories that say hotels are going to be what people trust more. And then I've heard people say, I've heard other experts say hotels are not the place. You, you want your own Airbnb, your own whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. I think it's too early to tell. I don't, I don't think we fully understand. And also, the, I think the other thing that, and I won't speak for anyone other than the U.S., but in the U.S., we have people who would get on a plane today. Here's that part of the population. And then we have a part of the population that said, I'm not going to get on a plane until there's a vaccine or a cure. There's this unknown, this, this big middle that's unknown of where are these people on the spectrum? Are they, are they ready to go back soon? Are they waiting for that, that assurance that there's some, some protection? So I think it's too soon to, too soon to say. But, but I do think that the future lies in trust, for sure. I think trust will be absolutely critical in the near future for customers, for travelers to get back out there. And that's everything from restaurants to airlines to hotels, tour operators, transport, whatever it is, they're going to want to be able to trust that, that it's a legitimate organization that is looking out for their health and safety. It goes back to solving the key problems and putting those out front and making sure it does get get resolved. Yes, and in fact, we're we're in the process right now of of working on uh, a a protocol for uh, health and safety. We're adding hygiene because we our our organization convened a group of guy of really experienced guides that that put together the international adventure travel guide standard. Mm -hmm. And so now we're looking at that and saying we would like to um, we would like to work safety and hygiene protocols into this, which, frankly, hygiene should have always taken a bigger a bigger role in safety management. Um, now it has to. Now it's very clear that there will be a mandate for that. You think that the uh, with the man so for sure it's going to be important, and you use the term. You know, mandate for it. Uh, how much do you think uh, industry is going to take take it on their own, or do you have a sense that it'll you know depend upon governments or people putting regulations in place and requirements? It's a good question. I'm sure there will be legal requirements for for from some governments. We're seeing uh, standards and protocols popping up all over the place, and my only concern with that is who's behind them. And is it, mm -hmm. is it mostly to appear trustworthy or even be trustworthy? Um, or or it, are true experts being involved in creating those, those protocols? So one of the things we're doing, we've hired true experts who are working on some protocols for adventure travel. We won't have anything to do with airplanes or airports. That's, that's somebody else's job and, and they know it better than we would. But what we can do is create the protocols for adventure travel companies and then drill down into activities to have, say, specialized protocols for hiking trips, for rafting, for bicycling, for climbing where you're sharing gear, 
et cetera, et cetera. So that's it's, something that is underway. Yeah, curiosity. How many of the, how many of those different? <laughs> there's. I would. My imagination takes me to a place of you're going to be making a lot of lists. <laughs> yeah, and and a lot of it will be baseline stuff. You know the hiking, but for a remote eco lodge, it's going to look very differently than it will for the transport company that gets people from the airport to the lodge. So there will be some variation, but then that some of those will have some crossover. Kayaking versus rafting, for example. There's some mm -hmm. uh, some good crossover there. So fortunately, it won't be 1,000 different. I'll keep you busy. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Well, and, and the industry is clamoring for it right now. People are, governments are asking us for it. Companies are asking us for it. And I think we're the right the right body to get that started. What's your approach to to the design? Is it uh, who's involved and who are the collaborators that you're engaging? So it's it's folks that have been involved with us in the past. So uh, like I mentioned, we worked on the adventure, the International Adventure Travel Guide Standard, which uh -huh. has to do with uh, technical skills, safety. Um, group management and customer service, sustainability, issues like that. So we're working with experts that have been involved in that. We uh -huh. also advise, we advise Airbnb on some of the risk management work that is done with the Airbnb experiences and adventures. Okay. So we have experience there as well. And then some of the people that are involved are also, we're also involved in the ISO standards for adventure travel. So these are very, very much technical process oriented individuals. In other words, I'm not writing the standards or the, the protocols. <laughs> You'll be glad to know. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how to, how, to, how to read that last comment about being glad I'm not in it. <laughs> well, I, I've never claimed to be a, a, a technical expert, so, uh, but we do have them in our, in our universe. So that's, that's who we're working with. Yeah. Every organization needs the experts and every organization needs somebody to, to make sure things are happening. So yeah, I'm glad Absolutely. you have a role in it. Yeah. John? Definitely. Yeah, I was just going to mention, I know over the next, what is it, six, seven years, tourism is supposed to be like a tenth of the jobs of the world, right? Mm -hmm. So we're only marrying ourselves even more to a potential worse crisis. What, what do you think is unique about this crisis? And how do you think we could, I know we can't walk around with bubble wrap all over ourselves, right? And cover ourselves in masks, but mm -hmm. how do you make, this is an un unexpected effect of uh, or blocker to tourism and being sustainable and traveling are often moving in two different directions anyways. So now at this point with the pandemic added in, and we know that's something that could happen. How do we try and prevent this happening or what what do you think that marketplace looks like over the next five years so that it, we don't repeat this mistake one in ten jobs we can't afford to lose that again yeah um boy i mean i could go so many directions with this i think i think um i think some of tourism needed to be reined in to be honest I think there are parts, and, and Barcelona is a great example mm -hmm. of a place that just got really overrun. And I know this won't be popular with everybody, but I think that industry drivers like super cheap budget airlines were one of the problems because if you can jump on a plane for $79, and go party in Spain from, from anywhere else in Europe, why wouldn't you? And the person buying those tickets and showing up, do they care about the culture and the local people and the environment? Maybe in some cases, but evidence as, as shown by people in Barcelona cutting bus tires on tourist buses and saying, go home, um, that evidence is not so much. So. Honestly, I think tourism needed a, a bit of a shaking of the lapels and to say, you know, shape up. And um, I think we have the chance for it to come back more responsible and still provide income 
maybe not the same numbers of visitors, but maybe the value of the visitors can be higher. Um, but I do think we're in for years before we get back to what we were seeing in 2019. Um, there's still no way to tell because there's still some factors out there that could change the game again. If we get another wave, if we get it hit again in the fall, if different gun, ra random governments shut borders. So I think what's unique about this crisis is it blew up all the, all the supply chains everywhere at the same time. You know, 9-11 scared the hell out of the world, but a week after it happened, you would still go back out and eat in your local restaurant, right? Or you would, you would still go on that, on that tour or maybe still even take that trip. You might be a little more nervous, but you're thinking, right. oh, I'm, I'm headed to Florida. I probably am gonna be fine or, or wherever you might go. But this has had a completely different effect where it shut everything down overnight. And so it showed some of the weaknesses in the tourism supply chain. And, you know, I think especially in the really passion driven side of tourism, a lot of those people run on really narrow margins because it's a tough business to run. It's super complicated. There's risks you have to manage, et cetera, et cetera. So they didn't have the, the ability of, of, say, a banking institution to say, don't worry, we've got plenty of you know, fat to live on in the, on the rainy days. Tourism doesn't really have a whole lot of that. So, um, so I think what we've all learned from this, and us included, is that the minute you think things are going great, buckle down even harder and <laughs> sock money away for a rainy month, for a rainy six months not for a rainy day. Um, yeah, so there will, be, there will be a percentage of the businesses that don't make it through this. Um, it's not all doom and gloom, to be honest. I think, I think better tourism can come back. And I think all those thousands of laid off people, a lot of them have great ideas that they could never enact in their previous company, let's say. So I think when things do start to recover, I think we'll have a, a flood of innovative, interesting new small tourism offerings it's one of the questions i had to piggyback with what you just asked about john so you look into the future and you mentioned uh that uh, a different profile for the traveler um that the ideas of thousands of people can to begin to emerge um, as a result of this what else would you like to see from your vantage point because <clears throat> you do have a really distinctly unique vantage point to, to see this on a global uh, scale. What other innovations, what other changes would you actually like to see come out of this? That y if you could look into beyond the crystal ball, if you had your way and you had to, and, and you had the wherewithal to say, here's two or three things that I'd really like to see come out of this, what would they be? I think the first one would be that, that governments and destinations really um, decide what they want tourism to look like. Because in a lot of cases, it's sort of just happened over time. And all of a sudden, they find themselves sometimes with a monster. And so what I'd love to see is for destinations to say, you know what, I'm sorry, but no more $39 flights to our destination. That's not, a, that's not acceptable any longer for us. Mm -hmm. And, and I think there's a really unique opportunity. We've never had a full stop before. So this is the opportunity for governments to sit back and say, what do I want my tourism to do for my destination? I would like healthy tourism for my destination. And some destinations already have that and they're doing great. Um, but some do need to, to rein it in and decide, we're gonna, we're gonna start being a lot more mindful about this. Like Bhutan has been mindful about it for ever since they've been open um for for international tourism they they set a price tag you gotta you need to spend this much in the country when you come and nobody's really to my knowledge outraged by that because they've just decided we don't want to be a high volume destination and that was the only way that they could they could see to control it and and as a result they've focused on gra gross national happiness instead of gdp and so I think more destinations have the opportunity, maybe not to go that extreme, but, but to say, 
when it comes back, this is what we want it to look like. And so here are the levers we can move in order to do that. So be, be more intentional and also start thinking about tying your national brand to it, sounds like. Absolutely, absolutely. So I, that, that's one thing I'd love to see. I'd love to see, and I don't know how to make this happen other than a magic wand, but I would love to see, um, I would love to see travelers switch away from the mindset of it's my right to travel and move to the side of it's my privilege to travel. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, the mental shift from it's my privilege to be here versus it's my right to be here is huge. It, it, it changes the way that travelers treat the people that they run across that are local, the way that they think about sustainability, for example. Um, so that's one of the things that I would love to see happen. And, and I've encouraged the tourism industry that I talk to, to, to say, you can, you can help change this attitude. I think it's time to stop marketing and say, you deserve this spa vacation. Do you? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> maybe you do, but, but, maybe you do. <laughs> but, but you see what, where I'm going with that, the subtle difference between, you know, we'll take anybody and, and just come use our destination. Instead, we welcome you. You're an honored guest. And, right. you know, we would like you to behave this way. And some places already do it. Like Jackson Hole hands out a, a, a little um, pamphlet saying, uh, I haven't seen it in a while, so I'm going to get it wrong. But essentially, the concept is, um, this is how we behave in this area. We don't approach wildlife. We take the buses when we can. And, and they had the local high schools help create the materials. Mm -hmm. And, and so they, they got the whole community involved. So it isn't just words on a piece of paper. The whole community, and they've done a remarkable job, has agreed, here are the things that matter to us the most about our waste disposal, about our wildlife, our traffic in town, quality of life, sustainability, renewable energy, and they're serious about it. They've done an amazing job. Anything else come to mind that you'd like to see come out of this? Trying to figure out how to say this without getting in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I know. I know you. I, I know you got a good round of applause when you, on a TED talk you once said, <laughs> "If you do something good for the world, go on a go on a vacation." <laughs> yeah, you know, I think that um, I think some sectors of the industry have to be have to have a hard look taken, and I would put Cruz in that category. That Cruz needs to take a hard look. It was having problems before the pandemic with things like norovirus, right? And 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 yet those remain highly, highly, highly profitable businesses, the, the big ship cruising I'm talking, I'm not talking about small, small ship expedition cruising. So I think cruise should have a hard look taken at it of how about environmental issues, labor and um, issues like that. So, and now, now they're gonna have to figure out the hygiene piece for sure. It sounds to me like if you looked at this from a broader perspective, uh, the, uh, there's a thread through all of this, uh, a theme that says the less transactional and the more intentional that, that travel is, uh, the better off we're going to be. And that uh, from, this, from the vantage point of adventure travel, uh, there's, there's just a greater uh, sense of mindfulness and um, a commitment to, to behaviors. Uh, yep. of an actual tourist or traveler in of itself, which really is quite a, a difference uh, between the transactional and the more um, called specialized or yeah. uh, you know, more adventurous, you, I suppose you get. And it doesn't even mean that adventure is always virtuous. There are plenty of adventure companies that are not living sustainably. And so I think you know, this is something, a magnifying glass that should be put on all of us. Mm -hmm. And, and I'll, I'll call out Disney Cruises as getting an, uh, I think, an A minus rating by Friends of the Earth last year. And they're a big ship cruise company, right? But they're, they're very intentional about how they treat their employees, about environmental treatment, treatment of waste, things like that. So anybody can be responsible, anybody. It's just choosing to say, this is going to be how we're going to do tourism going forward. It needs to be healthy for the planet, for, 
and fun for our customers. People go on vacation to enjoy themselves, right? Not to be preached at the whole time about plastic straws, even though, you know, those are important issues. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like you're personally talking directly to me. I know that millennials, which I fall into, even though my, my eyes are a little baggy, but I am young. Um, I know that we have a tendency to travel. We love traveling, but we travel a bit different than say a baby boomer. We love adventures. So we travel and we say that we want to go learn about the culture and become engaged in it and become a part of it. And I know taking longer trips is usually better because you immerse yourself more as yep. opposed to taking these little tiny trips. But even then, uh, we could say the, the worst travelers in the world are typically Americans or Brits in Spain, they're horrible, or the Chinese. So I wonder what, what are millennials gonna be like after for the first time in our lives, we have fear of not having money, fear of something bad happening. Do you think we'll become more reclusive or what are your anticipations as far as we're gonna be the, the big money pretty soon as we become the majority of the job market do you think we're going to want that or do you think we're just going to stay at home and try and save up for that house on top of that education bill that we still haven't paid yet? Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. That's a good question. I, I think um, one of the things millennials get praised for is caring more about some of the environmental issues than I'm, I'm generation X. So I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle there, but, um, but I, okay. I, think, I think what I, what I hope for, for everybody and for all, you know, for Americans, Brits, Chinese, everybody who's traveling, is that the, the sane voices win out. That the, the people who say, let's, let's start doing this responsibly um, because you don't have to break the bank to, to do a good adventure trip. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe it'll be closer to home for the time being for a couple of years because, you know, everybody's impacted and Millennials are too, for sure. And so it may be a little while before that dream trip comes, but you know, honestly, it was starting to get a little crazy when people would say, hey, let's go to Europe for the weekend. Well, yeah. it's nice that that's affordable, but it also, it's hard on the climate. It packs out the public squares everywhere. Maybe you should go, maybe all of us should travel fewer times, but go for longer and go deeper and actually learn a little language, mm -hmm. take a couple classes, really get to absorb a place and not just check boxes and try to be the youngest person to be in every country in the world, which I never like those records. I, I, I think people should go and it's other people's lives that we're engaging with. So I, I think we should take it really seriously. Yeah, and I think it's an amazing opportunity the fact that, I mean, some people, it's not the nicest thing to say, but never let a, a good crisis go to waste, right? Mm -hmm. That's what some people say, but mm -hmm. we're all working remote now. You're not tied mm -hmm. to a specific location by any means. Mm -hmm. So I think it's opened the door for many people, like myself included, who I love traveling, um, to no longer be rooted in one place. Digital Nomad was already a thing, but mm -hmm. maybe to an extent, it'll become a larger larger experience you don't want to fly to a place maybe you just have a van that you drive around in and that's your home now I, i'm interested to see in five months from now what are the early signs of life from the tourism industry as a whole yeah i think that um road trips are going to be big glamping is going to be really attractive mm -hmm. uh, because not everybody wants to hunker down in a pup tent on the hard ground but there are so many options now of, of fancy camps, I'll call them, um, <laughs> that are still quite affordable, cheaper than a, than a luxury hotel and set in beautiful locations, um, unique circumstances. I think, you know, I think that'll be something that, that at least Americans are going to definitely explore. I, I don't know about how glamping looks like in other places around the world. I, I know that Europe has quite a bit of glamping type stuff going on. Um, I think it'll be a gradual rebuild that people as they get more comfortable and then at the point that we have a vaccine or a cure, you know, obviously that's going to, that's going to be a game changer for sure. Um, but what's to say there isn't another pandemic that of a different variety five years from now. I, I honestly, at least for me in my career, I, I'm going to pretend like there's always one around the corner. 
and yeah. try to manage toward that. Be prepared for that and be prepared for a desert every once in a while. I'm going to ask you uh, something at a more personal level out of curiosity, Shannon. So here you are, you travel all over the world um, on behalf of the work that you do. And some of it is just so, so richly rewarding in terms of uh, your, your influence and, and your impact. Um, how are you coping with not traveling right now? Or, and is it, are you taking a, a, a deep breath? Does it feel good? Um, are you in, uh, because uh, there's a lot of people who travel a lot, who I've been talking to, that for the first couple of weeks or so, they said, <clears throat> wow, this is a welcome break. And now they can't wait to get back on the road again. Um, yeah. I'm just curious how, what it feels like for you, especially not just because you're, you're not just traveling on, on, uh, on business, you're traveling with purpose. And so how's that impacting you? How are you feeling these days? really conflicted um, because, you know, I've, I've been in this role for 16 years and then I was in a startup before that. And so I, I've traveled a significant amount in the last 20 years. And um, I actually was on sabbatical for three months when this pandemic hit. And so I was, I, my wife and I went to Colorado for a month and spent it off grid in the mountains. No, no, no running water, no electricity, except for solar. Wow. And, and then we spent a month on the beach in Brazil, where she's from. And then, and then we came back. So I'd already slowed down on my travel. And, and then we came back to this. And I still am taking the deep breath and enjoying not traveling. But I recognize that my circumstance is a little unusual. Uh, my wife is ready to get back on the road. And I think just because I'd been at it for so long, um, we've taken up literally mushroom farming and gardening and baking bread, and she's even making cheese. And so we, we've gone full homestead in the last mostly month and a half, and I, I've enjoyed it. I also am starting to get the itch, not necessarily to just be traveling, but we meet with our community of adventure travel professionals four or five times a year in person. And those are all shut off. And I am really sad about that. Our, our community is so close and supportive of each other that to have an event cancel is, is it's, it's very disruptive and not, not in a wonderful way. So I'm both enjoying not being on the road all the time and I'm dreading how airports seem like they'll be even more miserable than they were before. <laughs> and, um, and yet I, I know that, uh, I know that before long we'll be back out there and I, I'm looking forward to it. You know, I'm looking forward to getting back to Brazil. Um, I have a, I have a trip that's still technically on the books for Japan in October. And we're just kind of waiting to see if, if the, um, if the event still happens. And that's not our event. That's somebody else's event that I'm speaking at. So, mm -hmm. and I love Japan. So I am looking forward to that very much. I hope it happens. I hope things are at a point where we can do that at that point. John, anything else from uh, any other questions or inquiries? Out of, out of left field, I'm always throwing questions. No, uh, no, that's wonderful. I mean, it's great that you got to pause and that you have space to do that kind of gardening. And I'm, I'm in an apartment, so uh, I've been trapped in a small box for two months now. And that's uh, hard. <laughs> it, has, it has been a, a different experience. Um, it's gonna be interesting to see also the bottlenecks that come out of tourism. Like I mentioned, there's a lot of people like me that are just stuck in this small area. Uh, I drove down to Alabama, um, the beach, that beautiful beaches, if, if you never went by there, they're actually like powdery sand, beautiful. But my girlfriend's family lives down there. And so we went to go see her mom because we hadn't seen her in several months. And it, I've been going there my whole life. It was the most crowded place I've ever seen in my lifetime. And that was, I know it was Memorial weekend. I get that, but it was explosive. It was almost too many travelers and it yeah. was people with 
blatant disregard for social distancing, we'll say. It's right. great backlash. Right. Are you afraid that that backlash might cause more problems for tourism in general? I know that states are wary to open. You could say Florida's, Florida wouldn't even let uh, people from Louisiana travel there. So I'm banned from yeah. Florida for a little while. Do you think this backlash could occur where people go too crazy, say in Texas and Alabama and even California, people are at the beach all the time um, and just do away with tourism for an even longer term? Is that something you're fearful of or anticipating at all? Yeah, I'm definitely concerned about that. If, if numbers spike in actual infection rates and it causes states to shut down again, then we're, we're prolonging the problem. Yeah. Um, and I also think it's feeding the polarization of America because yeah. it seems like in general, the, um, the, the people who are demanding reopening and the people who are uh, arguing that we should be more cautious fall along political lines. So it worries me that it's just a deepening of a rift that seems increasingly unhealable. Yeah. And, and so that, that actually worries me on a longer term basis, even more than whether we get shut down here and there for another month, which at this point, the pain is so great, you know, we can handle a little more. Um, also, I want to say something. I, I, I realize I may have sounded really cavalier when I said we're mushroom farming and doing all that. I recognize I, I live in the country and I've got that freedom. A lot of my friends don't. We have a bunch of friends that are in apartments in uh, Sao Paulo and Lima and oh, yeah. other locations and they are in lockdown and I, I I cannot say that I know what that's like because I have country roads all around me and I can walk anytime so I do feel for folks like yourself who are feeling boxed up and so I recognize that some people's need to get out now um, is driven by something I don't understand because I'm not living that yeah, it's an it's a really interesting time as far as human interaction goes. Uh, mm -hmm. I wore a mask into the grocery store when I was down in Alabama, and was heavily judged. Uh, mm -hmm. my, my dad had autoimmune disorder, so I'm fearful that I could get it and pass it to him. Yeah. But it's like we've forgotten about uh, the people behind the mask or <laughs> or the reason they're wearing it, and mm -hmm. just decided that's like a a signal. To, uh, I, I'm one way or another when in reality I might have personal things along with it so it's it's an I interesting would, time I would have never seen that coming before this all happened that, that 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 it would further divide us instead of unite us and that does that worries me greatly you know the messaging of uh, we're all in this together is is a little difficult to actually see play out in the, in the circumstances that we have yeah it's absolutely true and yeah. it's Interesting too, because you just alluded to something, Shannon. That's so important. That's as we come back to this empathy piece, and you know, we've talked about it on this podcast about empathy and listening and mm -hmm. understanding somebody else's experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems to me like we're just not getting there in terms of having enough empathy for one another, and uh, in our situations, and uh, being open and receptive to one another's experiences in, in a much deeper and more meaningful way. You know, when this all started in, in mid-February, where it really started coming into the, the open, um, my wife and I, because there were no orders yet, so when everybody was starting to lock down in Washington, we were like, this is ridiculous. Let's go down, let's go, to, let's get a hotel in Seattle and enjoy the weekend. And we got into a restaurant that you usually can't get into um, because people were starting to, to fade out. And we went to the Pike Street Market and went around and bought from all the little or some of the little vendors and asked how they were doing. And they're like, it's really scary. Our business is 50% down. And, and so we were trying to be the of the uh, crowd that stayed out there. You know, the information hadn't really come out very much yet. And then on March 28th, one of our team passed away from COVID. And it changed everything. You know, we, we went from the side that said, you know, this is probably a bad flu, let's not destroy the world's economy over it, to having it get very serious very quickly. And so I'm, I'm not on either far end of the scale of either open it up now or 
don't open it again for six months because I, I see how the economic impact is going to cost lives too. There are people staying away from the hospital because they don't want to go when they should go. And depression and addiction and, and those sorts of things, I'm sure, are going to take a huge hit. So I'm I'm still, I mean, Nicholas um, Christoph, New York Times ed, uh, opinion uh, op-ed guy, wrote, I think it was last Friday, maybe, and we still don't know how this thing is going to play out. The numbers are still confusing. There was an epidemiologist who said, I know less now than I knew 10 years ago about viruses. And so that's where the call for empathy comes in. We don't understand it, but we know there's something going on. And I'm empathetic of the people who want it open now. I want it open now in some ways. Our, you know, the tourism business is being, you know, destroyed in front of our eyes. Um, but I also still know that we still don't fully understand this thing. And to be completely cavalier about it, it doesn't seem responsible either. Thank you. Yeah. Any other uh, advice, words of wisdom from uh, the seasoned traveler you are? Uh, we have a couple of minutes left. Is there anything else that you'd like to impart on uh, uh, people that will be watching and listening to this? Well, I guess if I made an appeal, it would be um, if you're somebody that cares about things like organic food and low carbon impact and things like that, just when you go back to traveling, think about how your trips are also could be um, still awesome and fun because that's why we go on vacation. Um, but also you can you can travel in a way that really helps the, the destination that you go to. And if you're already a seasoned traveler and you've traveled with some companies that you feel loyal to, that you really loved your experience with, and if you're not super damaged by this economic situation, consider checking in with them and asking, is there something I can do to help you? Uh, one of our members uh, made an appeal to her customers and said, all my Italian bicycling guides are unemployed and have no way to get income right now. And so the guides wrote a, uh, wrote a cookbook guide, or they wrote a cookbook, an Italian cookbook. And then um, if you made a donation to the company, 100% of that goes to the guides. And they raised $50,000 for their guides to, wow. to help them squeak through this time. Um, so if, you, if there's a travel company you love, just like you're thinking about your local restaurants and ordering takeout as a way of showing support, um, I don't think there's an industry that's gonna be hit harder than tourism. First, hardest, and last to recover. I think it's pretty safe to say that. So support, support the companies you love and um, I look forward to the day when we can get back out there and go to those magical places that help us be better people and help uh, make the world really better. Yeah, well, where is the, what, the first place you would like to travel once everything goes back to some form of, of normalcy? What's the first place on your list? I mean, Probably Colorado because it's my home state, but um, but I would say Brazil would be where my wife and I would go first. And we were there for last uh, New Year's and January, and we just love it there. And I'm and I'm learning Portuguese during this time. That's actually one of the things that I've taken on is my wife is teaching me and another friend uh, Portuguese. So now now I've gone from completely. Um, illiterate to lightly. <laughs> That's great. Oh, what part of Brazil? Well, you said Sao Paulo, I'm guessing? Um, Florianopolis. So it's, a, yeah. it's like the island paradise of the South. John, John spent time down in Brazil as well, played, oh, uh, played soccer down there. Yeah, no kidding. I had a year down there. So I was in oh. Sao Paulo for a bit and Rio. So, and Brasilia. Pretty much did the whole middle to lower part of the country. Yeah. So, it's a great. great place. It is so great. I love it there. Yeah, really oh. fun people. It's a different, different, very, that's, it's going to be weird to see. They touch, they hug, they dance all the time, literally dance all the time. So mm -hmm. it's going to be interesting to see what kind of rhythm they have after this. this yeah, even, even protests involve dancing. <laughs> it's, true. it's true. All right. Well, 
That sounds like something we might want to try uh, try here in this country. I kind of like that idea. Yes. A couple, of, a couple of quick thoughts as we wrap up. First and foremost, Shannon, uh, thanks very, very much for joining us today. Really oh, my pleasure. Conversation. Uh, and as always, John, thank you. We always seem to have a good time with this and, and learn a lot in our conversations. Of course. Uh, always a pleasure being with you. But uh, Shannon, uh, one other piece of this, because of uh, it, it, I, my condolences to you and your entire team for your loss in Thank March. You. I also was able to, um, I, I, as as part of that, I found your your video address to all your membership worldwide uh, through ATTA, and um, I think if anybody wanted to uh, grab a quick look at. Um, uh, a very empathetic and compassionate approach and a very real approach to the current situation that they might want to find you uh, in that, if you don't mind my saying so, because it's it's posted. It's still, I don't know if you know this or not, it's still uh, available for people of you. So it's a, it's a really good example of, uh, of uh, stepping in, you know, as a leader, being able to step into your role in the moment. So my congratulations to you on that as well. And and I, uh, it's it's kind of an odd one because at the same time, uh, my both my sympathies and condolences to you and your entire team. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you're uh, you are very much like a family and you have a worldwide community that that behaves like one. So yeah, uh, thank you, Edgar. My best to you all. Yeah, I appreciate that. And thank you, John. Nice to meet you. Yeah, awesome to meet you. Always love talking about travel. Uh, put a few years of study into it. So uh, yeah. love to see where it's going. I mean, it's it's a time to innovate. I mean, unfortunately, it's because of desperation, but that doesn't mean the result has to be a bad thing. So I'm excited. Right. Good luck, man. We'll come, we'll come out on the other side of this. And I think we have the opportunity to be better. And that's that's what our goal is. All right. Well, I guess we'll sign off now, huh? Uh, y'all come join me at the beach anytime y'all want. Uh, <laughs> you made it to Brazil. <laughs> I made it to Brazil in record time. It's, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's a it's a little cold because it's winter down there, right? Am I am I on point or fall? Am I? <laughs> no, you're you're. Uh, let's see. Where are we right now? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Fall. I had to think hard <laughs> myself. <laughs> Well, thank I'm you very much. And I knew that one. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I guess this is us signing off. Thank you all for watching. Thanks again, Shannon, for joining. Uh, this has been Innovation Hour with Edgar and Jay Say, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Take care. Bye bye. Take care.